um, <clears throat> our host, Facebook slash Instagram, is going to give us a talk uh, about using Python 3. And to give that talk, we have Jason Fried. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you. Um, my name is Jason Fried. I'm, I'm a production engineer here at Facebook. Uh, I've been here since October 2011, uh, on Halloween even. Um, I taught myself Python because it was the more socially acceptable language um, at Facebook than Perl. Uh, it took about a year until I was uh, really confident enough as a new Python programmer to start taking an active role in the, the community of, uh, at Facebook. So. I initially got started by, by helping people out in the internal um, Python group, uh, being kind of the first to answer questions, because I guess I didn't have a lot of time as a new hire, um, or I had a lot of time as a new hire. Uh, I kind of became internally famous uh, in Python circles, and uh, when I saw an issue that we were just doing something wrong, I just stepped in and I fixed it. it didn't, it's not like I owned it, I just did it. So over time, people started to accept my expertise. This is uh, mostly how Facebook works. It's not top down. There's no decrees. It's, it's kind of a meritocracy of ideas. You have to sway public opinion by you know, the merit of your ideas, or you kind of try to cash in some of your social capital from helping people um, to convince them that your ideas have merit. So here's a little timeline of our change for getting to Python 3. Um, so changing something this big at a company as large as Facebook takes time. Uh, so let me tell you a story about during our free time and with no authority whatsoever, we made Python 3 the default version for Python at Facebook. In 2013, at the same time we were getting access to Python 2.7, uh, we got access to Python 3.3, which is a lot different than what Python 3 is today, but um, it was part of a task to add Python 3 to our build system. Well, that task had been stalled since uh, late 2012. It was blocking on adding Python 3 to our internal libraries, which can't be added unless we can build them. It's kind of a weird circular problem. Um, so this didn't really get us much. It was like you would just install Python 3 on your laptop. It doesn't mean I can run it across the servers at Facebook. So sure, we had it. It was there, but nobody, nothing supported it yet. You, you couldn't use it. It was very theoretical. So. It, it also didn't help that the popular opinion of Python 3 at Facebook during 2013 was really negative. Uh, most people in the company were either planning on st like staying in Python 2 forever kind of mentality. Oh, we'll just be in Python 2.7 forever. And some people were just were talking about jumping to another language altogether. Um, and I even, you know, I said something along these lines internally once. And in my defense, it looked pretty hopeless in 2013 that we would ever be able to run Python 3 in production. Well. You know, at the time, only one person, this was 2013, only one person called me out on my statement and said, why don't you do something about it? Because I was just complaining, you know. So it wasn't all bad. You know, we had some rays of hope. We had this thing, so somebody decided, you know, they foresaw that, that, that Python 3 was coming down the road, and they were like, how can I make my Python 2.7 code live longer? <laughs> like, how can I make it, like, last longer? So they decided we would set up this, like, Python, this linter that would require that you use the four infamous imports. Um, it was an attempt to, yeah, basically extend their, the, the code uh, life. Uh, the future imports are now pretty much used everywhere at Facebook, unless you're Python 3 only code, but that's more modern. Um, and we, it m means that we really had to solve a lot of our Unicode issues, like in the first talk. We, we solved them in 2013, because we forced people to use these things, and they had to solve them. And um, and we, sure, we introduced new ones because people were writing Python 2 code that accepts strings or Unicode, and they sometimes use base string, and they sometimes use instances testing to figure out what kind of weird behavior you have. And we had to fix those again in Python 3, but they were easier because we made the, the jump sooner. So uh, yeah, these imports would make it easier to convert most of those modules to Python 3, um, which also leads to one of our other big problems uh, was Thrift. So Thrift, Thrift is a RPC framework um, and serialization uh, system. Uh, it's used extensively at Facebook, and it, it allows services to talk to each other. We use it everywhere. And it's that core dependency that if we didn't have it, it would never, we would never be able to do Python 3. And so in October 2013, the Thrift team put up this poll internally, we're like, hey, we're looking for things to work on as a Thrift team. What should we do? And it was an open poll, so anybody could add. Someone added Python 3 support. I don't know who, it, you can't really tell these things. 
but it, it was strangely was very popular. I voted for it because I thought, hey, if we're gonna have to add Python 3 support, that means we get to clean out all the old cruff and it'd be a great thing for, for Thrift because I hated it. Um, and, but I still wasn't on board yet for Python 3 until I went to a talk that Guido was giving and it was on October uh, 16th, 2013. This was at Yelp in San Francisco and he was talking about a thing called Tulip. Well, Tulip would later become AsyncIO and I was already a big fan of async in, in Python 2, but I was really dejected about the, the, the different types of frameworks and they weren't compatible. So, uh, but async IO in my head opened up this magical future where we would have a single unified framework where I as a library owner wouldn't have to make a religious decision about which async framework you use personally. I just wrote the library and you use it. Uh, so before this talk was over, I was already messaging you know, it's Facebook, we're already messaging the Thrift team, be like, hey, there's this thing called Tulip, and we need to support it in Thrift for Python 3. Um, it wasn't even, you know, it, it, like barely even out yet. It's not even in uh, PyPI at that point. Um, so, <laughs> and I was like, we should do that instead of waiting for G-Event or Twisted to support Python 3, because if we had waited, we would have to, we'd implement it last year. So, um, and they, as a Thrift team, I, I kind of convinced them, it's like, if you support this, this is the only framework you have to support. It reduces their, because they were supporting both Twisted and G-Event and Tornado and some other things. And after Guido's talk, I was really pumped about the future of Python 3. And um, a couple days later, on the 19th, the Thrift team put up a roadmap and went, it included in their roadmap for the next year, Python 3 support and Tulip support. So that was my big win. Um, and I was sold on Python 3 at that point. So back to our timeline change, in 2013 we really had a, we didn't really have any rough plans. It was, or we only had rough plans. It was like Python 3 wasn't gonna happen. Most people didn't think it was gonna happen. And by happenstance, we've kind of set ourselves up for a win later. So if I wanted Tulip to be a thing at Facebook, and by extension, Python 3, I would have to be sure that Python 3 was easy to use or at least possible to use. So I kind of aided the Thrift team um, uh, with their code reviews and helped them port some, some stuff. And by February 3rd, um, the, the, the new hire that was working on Thrift Team, he was able to ship uh, Thrift support for Python 3. And then later he landed rudimentary Tulip support. It was so new, we, we, we kind of just did our best. <laughs> so, but for six months, the support just kind of sat there. Uh, we had built up this infrastructure, but nobody was using it. It was kind of like these cities in China where they, they, they explode of urbanization and growth and economics, that, but they were left abandoned because they don't have the people to fill them yet or they don't want to move there. So um, I don't think we had a plan yet, but we were hoping someday somebody might use it. And well, that was all about to change. In August of 2014, I had started a project to rewrite a service that I had unfortunately become the owner of. And I was gonna rewrite it completely from the ground up using modern infrastructure and modern best practices. See, I wanted the service to last for many years to come and I wanted it to be free of all the crushing technical that, that, had, that had strangled its predecessor. And I was gonna write it in Python 2.7 in G-Event. Wait, so I was already a believer, I was actually technically a believer in this future of Python 3, uh, maybe deep down somewhere, but I hadn't, maybe actualized yet. So it's like, if I, it don't let me, if I wanted, if I was gonna write my service in Python 2.7, it was gonna be obsolete from day one. That one day somebody would have to do the work to undo that technical debt to move to Python 3. So, you know, I, it's, the thing is that change won't happen on its own. Somebody has to be the first person and that person should be you. So for Facebook and Python 3, that person was gonna be me. And in the words of Gandhi, be the change you want to see. So if I wanted Python 3 to be a thing at Facebook, I would have to be that change. So I started writing my project in Python 3. Oh, and everything was broken, as you can imagine. Um, no one or nobody was using Python 3 at Facebook. It was it, like I wrote a build config for an entry point, um, and it wouldn't even build. Like the build system was treating Python 3 like it was Python 2.8 and disguise it. The dependency trees, a refused to resolve because all the wheel dependencies were built for Python 2. So it, and you know, in that thrift uh, support that we landed six months before, over the last six months, people had made fixes that were Python 2 only. 
and we'd basically broken, we had a ton of regressions that broke all that support. And Swig and Boost wrappers that people had written in the past and are still and were fundamentally broken in Python 3 in regards to handling binary data. Uh, when I resolved enough of these issues to get my project to finally compile, it, then it stack traced immediately when I ran it, and it turned out it wasn't even my code, it was the machinery that we used to make our entry points work and be sane. So, while I, I wrote my project, I was really having to fix the world around me, or at least the much of the world I needed uh, to work for Python 3. I had to rebuild a ton of third-party wheels so in our build system, and every time um, I needed an internal library somebody in the company had used, I had to convert it to be 2.3 myself. And I had this problem every day, somebody would check in when I wasn't looking, they would check in a, a, a change to their library, which, you know, why would they do such a thing? And it would break Python 3, because they didn't know. And, uh, or they would upgrade one of these third-party wheels we have, and it would blow away my, my Python 3 version, and it would just put a Python 2 in its place. Um, so, that's because the build system defaulted to only building for Python 2. Um, I found out most of, these, most of these regressions were actually, while they were valid Python 2 code, they were syntax errors or name errors in Python 3 that could be easily caught by things like linters. So I had to, I had to kind of force some compliance. Now I said before that Facebook is not the organization that you can from top down control over technology and say you have to do it this way, but changes can sometimes come from the bottom up and, or have to come from the bottom up. So well, us engineers, sometimes we can force compliance um, by being a little sneaky. So I quickly learned that if you, if you act with uh, authority, people will assume you have it. Um, and I think I used up a good portion of my social capital in 2014 and relied on my kind of perceived status as a SWE for uh, software, uh, or the, the subject matter expert for Python to, um, to just kind of let people look the other way. Uh, in late August of 2014, I instituted this automatic PyFlakes uh, linter uh, that would run on all new code when it was submitted for review. Um, PyFlakes was good at the time because it was, it, it had a lot of, it didn't have that many false positives. And I could sell it as a way to improve our code quality. Uh, since we were already running a PEP8 linter and the four imports linter, uh, I made sure that the, uh, the PyFlakes linter ran once under Python 2 and then once under Python 3 so that uh, people not writing Python 3 code were required by the linter to not commit new obvious errors. So in effect, I was forcing them to write Python 3 compliant code, or, or sort of, but this allowed me to distribute the job of maintaining Python 3 support so I could focus on finishing my project. So linting is not a, a perfect science. Um, you really need unit tests. So for those libraries I was using that I had to do all the work to get for Python 2 and 3, I just went and changed their unit tests to run in Python 3 and in run Python 2, kind of like I did with the linters. And so, uh, Maintainers would know immediately if they were changing their libraries that they were breaking compatibility that somebody was, was assuming. Um, I found that unit tests was a way easier way to, to force compliance than, than issuing a task after the fact. Say, hey, you broke me there. Could you fix it? It was more like if I put a linter in there, they would just not break me to begin with. Um, and it was more easy to uh, keep people uh, to be compliant, or it wasn't always easy to make them to be compliant. So I had to be responsive to people's cries for help. At first, I spent a lot of time in the diff review comment sections of a lot of diffs, like pointing out the Python 3 lint errors and telling people, explaining why the name error Unicode is not a defined, why that's not a false positive, and you know, it, it is legitimate lint error. So, and I had to kind of explain why they should care. I'm like, oh, it's for the future. You know, this code might run in Python 3 one day. And it was always one day. So, but, but the thing basically is if we had to also, I had to try to make it easier. Because if, if supporting Python 3 seemed hard to the developers, they would give up. They'd throw their hands in the air and they would say, ah, oh, just, we can be on Python 2 forever. It's just too hard, too hard, too hard. So I ended up making a, um, I ended up making, taking the third party module six and future, which allow you to write really easy Python 3 and 2 polyglot code. And I, I did a trick of the build system to make them automatically just populate on everybody's dependency trees so that uh, they would just be there. So when I, when I came into a comment section on their diff, I could say, hey, do it this way. And they're like, oh, I don't have that module. I was like, yes, you do. And, uh, 
and they would, they, would, they would import six, it would be there, they'd have changed their build config at all, and it was just there, so it would make it easier for them to be compliant. Um, I also went and fixed that, that third party wheel building system so that um, the build config templates were not just defaulting to Python 2 only, that they would actually do 2 and 3. Um, that removed a very time consuming process of having to go back in time and basically rebuild those things that people had built to be Python, 2, uh, Python 3 support. Um, so with a lot of those things in place, we were no longer losing ground in Python 3, but we weren't really gaining any ground. I joined a teaching rotation in 2014 for a new hire uh, class called Python at Facebook. It was started by Moshe. Uh, it informed new engineers of the realities of Python at Facebook and prepared them for the gotchas that might stand in their way. Because of the linters, uh, the class already instructed engineers that they were expected to write two, three compatible code, because that one day in the distant future, we might switch. Unlikely as it was at the time, but we told them this. Well, writing 2.3 code and only ever testing it and running it in Python 2 is not enough to advance um, Python 3 at Facebook. We wanted to get to a future where people wrote Python 3 for new code and only wrote 2.3 code when supporting legacy systems. So in 2015, I took the matter into my own hands and I made a change to the class sides and informed one of, uh, formed the other teacher, I think it was just one person at the time. Uh, the, class, the, the class now said that all new code at Facebook should be written in Python 3, and that you should never write Python 2 code unless it is a legacy project. And even then, it should be 2.3 code because that either that project dies or one day it will be have to convert it to Python 3. And we taught them this. To, we taught them to expect things to just work, dependencies are, should just be there, and if, the, if not, file a task, complain about it loudly, or fix it themselves. And that's what happened. So I have this thing, educate for the future you want, not the present you have. I started using this statement to justify the new hire class to become this like propaganda to drive change. Um, <laughs> hell, most of the core dependencies already worked. It wasn't that much of a lie. Um, and they were mostly converted in 2014. So everything should have worked. All I really needed was the people to use Python 3 to keep its support from regressing. In January 2015, I, shipped, I finally shipped my project. Uh, it was the first Python 3 project at Facebook. I spent most of the year in 2015 selling that as the new blessed, better alternative to the original service. It worked out, it won. It's, it's, it's currently running in service. Uh, it's very successful. Um, but, and by this point, a lot of allies had, had kind of come out of the woodwork and been known as being supporters of Python 3, including our very own Lukas Longa, who's a core developer for Python, or CPython, and he joined uh, the company in 2013, and I didn't even know he was here until 2015, and uh, so together with a few others, we were able to, really able to push the bar in 2015. And a, a strange thing really like, was, was about to happen. Uh, Wukash had somehow convinced Instagram to move to Python 3, and so in 2016, he and I formed a brand new team dedicated to shepherding Python at Facebook. Before we didn't have a team, it was just individuals. You know, and we did, that's where we did most of the work, was just individuals, free time. Uh, now there was, there was only two of us, but because we had the name, it had a, little, a lot of validity to our efforts. Our primary mission was supporting Instagram and, to, and their move to Python 3. Uh, and we saw a slow but steady growth of Python 3 usage at Facebook. Internal discussions were commonly about Python 3, and every day we'd hear about some new project and how they had chosen Python 3 for the new code. It was obvious that the tide of public opinion had shifted, um, and Python 3 was, use was growing, even though it wasn't the default uh, version of the build system for projects. Uh, you, you had to go uh, kind of out of your way to configure um, Python 3, and most people just didn't remember to do so. Uh, we even used to say that Python 2 will probably always be the default version. Well, not anymore. Um, in 2016, I, uh, or, or May 2nd of 2016, I made a post ex um, expressing my intention. You never say, I'm doing this. You say, oh, I'm, I'm thinking of doing this, and if nobody complains, you do it. So I, I'm making Python 3 the default version of the build system. Uh, one of the arguments was that using a legacy version of Python, I like to say these things like this, for new projects was a waste of company money. Since any project starting with Python 2 will at some point be upgraded to Python 3, so why not save the technical debt and use modern Python to begin with? Uh, the post received unanimous support. There were no complainers. No, nobody said, no, we shouldn't do this. By May 5th, so three days later, I had modded all the existing uh, Python 2 build configs and indicated they needed to be using a legacy version of Python when they built. 
and uh, made Python 3 the default at Facebook. Uh, with the millions of lines of Python code and the thousands of pars, I didn't really break anything. Nobody seemed to really notice. It just was the next logical thing to do. Sure, there were a couple of people that didn't rebase, you know, just right, and they had a weird thing when they, they finally got the latest. But other than that, it wasn't, there was no like, oh my God, this is horrible. Uh, in 2016, we also formed uh, what I call the uh, shadowy council of, for Python domination. Uh, this uh, chat group was kind of made of all the allies throughout the company that, had, that were like directly active in Python. And we used this group to kind of keep ahead of, of any compatibility issues, discussions and directions of the language at Facebook, and keep abreast of any dissenters to our plan. See, so you can't do this thing like this alone. You, you really need allies in the fight. Now, there were, there were only about 10 people total that really made all this happen. Um, and they came and went at various times. We really only had three people at any one time collaborating on driving Python 3 adoption. Now, the future of Python at Facebook is bright as ever. In 2017, we are finally in that glorious future where we can have nice things again. And in Q1 of this year, Instagram finished their migration uh, to Python 3, and now they are free to start making use of new technologies. They can use async I.O. And we can, um, oops. Now, uh, and now we can focus on things like uh, PEP484 typing and uh, migrating more services to make use of async I.O. and make Python at Facebook fun again. This year, it was, we started a project to, uh, to replace the um, thrift stack that I complained about earlier with a new one that wraps C++ asynchronously. And it's immutable uh, for data structures. It's, it's really awesome. Um, now we were able to upgrade Python 3 uh, versions without a lot of fanfare. And it's like, it's no longer this dark day, oh god, they're updating Python 3, oh, I'm not gonna go in that day. It's, it's now, it's like a Christmas. It's like, oh, look at the goodies we have. We updated to Python 3.6.3, this is awesome. What, what do we have now? Oh, we've got these, special types, and we have all these ex special things with async I.O. It's, it's a wonderful world. So Python at Facebook is fun again. And uh, yeah, it's, so the problem that we have now actually is that services and library owners are, are internally are asking the question, can we drop Python 2 support? And we are seeing a lot of Python 3 only regressions in Python 2 code. So the problems I had before, it's, it's kind of like happening against those folks. And we're like, well, you, you, you need to, make your test run in Python 2 if you want to maintain that support. But um, so here's kind of a graph of how we, we were growing in uh, our support. We started out in Q3 of 2014. We had four Python entry points. One was the Py3 fl uh, flake linter that I wrote, and the other three were from my project. So those four, that was me. Uh, <laughs> this didn't change enough for almost a year until Q2 in 2015 when uh, uh, fifth entry came along. That was uh, Wukash had written a uh, um, Python 3 service. And sadly, we, I didn't maintain statistics uh, after for about a year. And then two days after I switched the default Python, which I have a little, a little marker there where I switched it, um, Cooper Lee's put out, or host, put out a, uh, an automatic stats gather so we could actually every day, several times a day we'd run and we'd actually go out to the, the code base and say how many entry points are there and what versions of Python are they configured for? So we actually have some really, some really nice data. Um, it was surprised to find out that th it was like three days later when we ran it, we had 4% of Python entry points were already Python 3. So we have a lot of entry points, so just to let you know that. Um, and we, they were not the default, but we already had 4%. Um, and today we're, we're at 40% of all entry points. And the green line here, that's where I didn't have any data, so I just kind of extrapolated because I wasn't gonna spend the time to actually like step through the Mercurial repository day by day and do the math, so just made it a green line. So. Um, you know, that was, that's why you should have, important to have stats. So I would really claim that this is a success, that it's now at Facebook, it's kind of an embarrassment if you say that your project is Python 2 only and you have no plans to move to Python 3. Most people are like, oh no, we have plans. It's, it's on the roadmap, it's on the roadmap. Because they feel guilty, you know, it's like, oh. They, and, and a lot of them, they want the shiny new toys that we have. They want to use that in their old projects. They want to have, they want to play with them too. And they want to get to Python 3. They're just, you know, they're putting it off for some whatever reasons. And they're in the minority now. So let's review. If you build it, they will come. Don't just say that we should move to Python 3. Make it a possibility. Uh, change has to start with somebody. It should be you. Pick Python 3 first for your project. Um, don't do it alone. You're going to need help. 
Um, linters and unit tests can kind of force people to help you, but find your allies and recruit them to your cause. Um, if you're not currently educating your new hires, start and train them for what you want. It doesn't have to be what it currently is, it's what you want to get to. And collect statistics, definitely, that, that, that's a game changer. Because when we started putting up, a, we put up a, um, a dashboard where you could see the percentage of Python 3 per like team in Facebook, it kind of added a gamification. And people were like, I want to get our, our percentage to like 80. And you know, like they would come and be like, oh, we have 100% in our directory and, our, and the code is 100% is Python 3. And it, you know, I guess, you know, show it around like it was a golf score or something. But, um, and finally, write some awesome stuff in Python 3. Because the awesome stuff, that attracts even more people to want to convert. They're like, oh, they have all the cool toys in Python 3. Can we convert? And they're like, I don't know, we looked at it a couple years ago. It seemed hopeless. Maybe we can do it now. So, questions? Thank you, Jason. All right. I saw a question right here, John. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, when you said you were putting in uh, PyFlix and other linters, did you do a switch on for all projects once you had fixed everything per project or even actually, per file that was modified? Actually, uh, we, we were pretty wild west back then. So um, that thing went out for everybody. That was, it, had, it was a Python file. It got linted for both. And it wasn't until like the next couple weeks that we gave you an option to turn them off. And then we highly discourage people to do that. You know, if you turned off both, it was like you were going to get nailed to a wall. But if you, uh, if you turned off just for Python three, it was like, you know, we've since moved on. We have a we have a, a, a different linter. Oh, different. Uh, uh, we, it's basically the same idea with Flake eight, and Flake eight's got plugins and stuff. So, you know, it's oh gosh, baby. Okay. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Wait, this is an open source linter that you wrote, Ukash. No, um, we're using um, as much open source as possible. So it's um, it's essentially Flake Eight, and uh, the the additional plugin that we uh, that we're using is actually open source on just my GitHub account because I started it on a Saturday. So um, start your open source projects on Saturdays in California, then then they're yours. Um, yeah, but uh, we have a MetaFlake wrapper that is written in async IO uh, and. Uh, it runs the Python 2 and Python 3 linters um, like in parallel and deduplicates the messages. So like that, that removed a lot of the friction of people seeing like the same warnings twice on the, on this and whatnot. And we like unified the way to turn them on and off. It was like, it was really janky before there was like 10 different ways to, to, to configure the linters before. So yeah, yeah. but essentially it's, st it's still flake eight, but like has like a ton of plugins. Like Instagram has like five of their own, but like, mm, these are like specific yeah. to like how they're using Django. If you, if you make it easier and painless as possible, people will comply. Very nice. Oh wow, lots of questions. Okay, I'm gonna just go what's closest to me here. <laughs> I'll make my way around. Craig, Python three, you gave a talk before. Uh, so, uh, one question that I have is: so, based on your talk, it sounds like at the beginning, uh, so Python three was happening, and you were kind of reacting to it and bringing it into Facebook. But now, Facebook is probably one of the biggest users of Python three in the world. So, the question I have is. Uh, is Python as a language moving in a direction that uh, is good and will help Facebook uh, you know, grow and scale? And are there things that you would like to see in the language? Like what are the things that are interesting for you and for Facebook? And well, do you think that Python is focusing on those things? I, I think they are. We're, we're getting the, the stuff that helps developers reason about their code. So the typing stuff that's been going on uh, is very helpful. Um, I think we, like, at the time when we were experimenting, where people were doing, like, oh, I'll add Python 3.3 to the build system and see if anybody says anything. Like, I don't think anybody was really sure. It was like, everybody was kind of wishy-washy about whether or not they were going to go to Python 3 at that point. It wasn't until 3.4 people were like, ah, we should move, you know, let's, let's go. And 3.5 came out and people were just like, oh, yeah, async await, this is great. Um, but uh, I think... Um, yeah, we do have some of, like we have one of the largest async IO deployments in the world, um, just because we we know that people bigger us aren't using it yet. So, um, <laughs> the um, I think the 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 community is working on like cause we have our, we have our own core developer, but 
Please. Yeah, I, this is actually, I'm going to tack on to Craig's question. That, that was my question. Uh, like, so you talk a lot about uh, Facebook's usage of open source Python. Um, and I was kind of curious that beyond, like, you know, thrift and also uh, Ukash's um, salary, what is Facebook <laughs> doing for open source Python? <laughs> uh, because as, as you know, I mean, Facebook does amazing things for open source PHP, almost overtaking PHP itself with the seven thing. So uh, I kind of wonder, like, what analogous thing is happening with Python? Well, some of the things we would find, like, the way, before we kind of, like, started the Python team, that the way we would build Python internally at Facebook and put it into RPMs and the, uh, around the world, the, um, they would have these, like, private patches that they would carry for years at a time, and, and it was like, why weren't these ever open sourced? Like, why, why don't we, it, like, so in, in our boot camp, that new hire class that, that became propaganda, the, um, one of the things I kind of harp on now is that, you know, we have, we have a license, we have the, the, the contributor agreement signed for, as a company, so I encourage new hires when they come in, it's like, if you fix something, don't just keep it here. You know, if it applies to the open world, go out and put the pull request for CPython or some of these related modules that, we're, that we, we already have agreements with, so you don't have to go talk to legal for, for two weeks. You can just do it now. So we have a, a mentality that if, you, if you're gonna fix something, just go and fix it. Like, so we, we do a lot of type shed fixes and MyPy fixes and so like that, where we like, oh, because we're, we're, we're using all this stuff, we come across these errors and we don't just be quiet about it. In the past, people were just like, oh, it didn't work. I fixed it. Well, did you tell anybody? We do stuff for the open source. Come on. Well, no, I mean it's a it's a question. It's not a rhetorical yeah. question. Yeah. So uh, did, I remembered. Yes. So uh, first of all, between three six zero and three six two, we had patches merged to Python from twelve people at Facebook. So I guess that's pretty cool. That's pretty um, good. Yeah. Two sprints. Yes, we are gonna we're organizing core sprints. Uh, we did one last year for core developers for a week. Uh, which was the most productive week in Python's history, uh, which was pretty cool. And uh, this year we did the same. It was still very productive, but it was very different from last year because last year was like quite before the beta freeze, so everybody was just like rushing to finish their features. This time it was like, how about we change everything? So like a lot of peps were born and discussions like this. But yeah, like twice in a row, uh, course prints. We are actually uh, sponsoring the Django Software Foundation, like not the Python Software Foundation uh, so far as, fa as far as I know. Um, but yeah, like we're contributing to it. We have people that are essentially working most of their time on it. So that's, that's our contribution for now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it sounds pretty good. Uh, I mean, but I probably don't need to remind anyone here what Mozilla's books look like compared to Facebook's. <laughs> they're, the, they're sponsoring PSF. So I saw a question here. Was there a question here? Am I standing behind someone with a question? Nick? All right. Um, so it sounds like a lot of this work was, uh, this slow migration was possible because there's a lot of like different projects that can choose to run under Python 2 or 3. But, um, you know, I don't know if you have any thoughts, organizations where it's really just one big code base that just. Well, uh, like Instagram gave a talk at uh, PyCon last year, so I didn't really cover it very well, but they talked about, you know, the incremental changing everything over, like basically redoing their unit test for Python 3 and doing basically going through and 2 3 their entire code base to make it polyglot. And then moving to Python 3 and then a week later stripping out all the Python 2. So um, they really wanted to get there quick. So I, I think even if you're, if you're in a single code base, you can start by you know, taking like everything, unless you're in one single file and we're like in the eighties, but no, like you, you, you're going to have multiple, multiple modules. There can be different packages, no matter how big your application is, it's going to be, it's going to be organized. So you can pick one and you can go in there and you can fix it to be two, three, you can put unit tests that'll run, you know, like you can basically run a secondary set of unit tests that run into Python three, like blacklist all the ones that fail or, and just basically churn through it until you've converted them all. And it usually doesn't take that long, as long as you can put the either linters in place or unit tests to prevent people from like prevent you from constantly having to refight the same battle. Um, you will start to make headway, and if you can convince others that this is a great idea, look at this cool thing. Like you show them, like, oh, this is how we have to write this now. And if we're in Python three, 
we would just uh, we would just yield from the the generator that we're using this now. But in Python two, I I have to call that and then I extend a list and then I pass that you know, and I eventually return that list. It's just it was really weird, but like eventually you convince them. They're like, oh yeah, Python three is really nice. Like even the enemies we had, like I said, the dissenters that were against our plan. They they did show their faces. Eventually, like at some point they were like, yeah, I mean, you know, this Python three thing is not, not a good idea. But um, the greatest thing was when we were like we showed them, and then they're like, oh, let me go and convert all my projects to Python three. And then they were like, we like added them to the shadow council. You know, it's like you should you should come join and, and be a part of this this plan. So I think even even if you're you know you have one application, you can work towards that way. You can get to the point where one day you can be like, I'm gonna let's let's take let's like I can do web apps because you can say oh let's say half the fleet in this cluster we're gonna make them run under Python three, and maybe you don't do that immediately. It depends on how how clowny your organization is, but um, you can you can basically maybe I can replay traffic to this this tier and it'll run on Python three and we'll see if it blows up. And then maybe it's like, hey, I'll put 1% of the machines that handle traffic, I'll make them run a Python 3. And we'll see if we have like crazy explosions and um, exceptions or just behaves incorrectly and we have a bunch of violations. But uh, you can eventually get there. One more question. Uh, you talked about all the ways you discovered to move to Python 3 the right way. Um, what are some of the ways you discovered weren't the right way to push for Python 3 support? Hmm. Um, have, being heavy-handed about it sometimes works. Um, the, like, I, I'm trying to think of things we did that were wrong. I think it was basically when we, we, try, we, 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 we forced people to use the Unicode uh, literals, but we didn't actually actually give them any, like, this was before my time, really, like, in getting involved, because I remember always having to use them from day one. But we didn't give them any guidance on this is what Unicode is and why you should care. And it was just like, no, you, now you have all these errors and lint problems that you're going to have to fix. So good luck. And uh, that caused other problems that we had to eventually get by later. Um, yeah, it's like uh, people people have been or people who don't are aware of Unicode and and and, and bytes. They they'll write uh, C extensions where they'll accept they'll accept bytes and they move to. Python 3, and you have the same C extension, but you have this thing that's like, it's a string field, like, oh, set the name of your process. And it's like, why is it taking bytes? That's a string, right? You know, or it's like, uh, oh, there's this, this, this the data structure, and these, these, are, these are human readable things, strings, and they come back as bytes. And you're like, what? So yeah, it's just, it's just basically, we didn't give people guidance in the early days, and they kind of dug us a little hole that we had to work out of. And there's still, you still find that where like, you, you're, trying to, you're trying to use some code, and it's like, wait, you're checking if it's either, String or Unicode or bytes and wait, what are you doing again? You like you try to track down all their callers and we like make sure but like nobody's passing in a str uh, passing in bytes to this. What are you doing? Let's strip all that out, you know, and get to the modern world. All righty. Oh, David, a question. Uh, yeah, very quickly. Have you considered writing this up so that other people that are suffering through this um, transition make it a little easier for them? Yeah, I think the, the point of this, well, I made this talk, but um, the point of this was not really, like, oh, this is technically how you move from Python 2 to Python 3, because people have done those documentations, there are modules. This was more about the social engineering aspects of it, like how you, yeah, okay. Um, I've given this talk a couple times. I, I guess we could maybe do a blog post about it at some point. Yeah, yeah. blog post sounds good too. All right, well. In this case, any more questions, let's take them offline. But yeah, for now, thank you very much, Jason.